Noah, did you get a new lab coat? I did. Thank it you for noticing. Sparkling white. Yeah, I just had it bleached. We should get a picture of it before it gets dirty. Good idea. All right, ready? One, two, three. Pim pals. Oh, oh. Let's take a look at that one. Oh, that's pretty good. Hey, look at that. We got an orb. A what? An orb. Oh, that's not an orb, Gravy. And I'll tell you why. Paranormal 101. Hi, I'm Gravy. And I'm Noah with the Paranormal Investigators of Milwaukee. And this is Paranormal 101. With photographic anomalies. So, in this last instance, we were talking about a picture that we took. And we saw what you thought was a... An orb. An orb. And you thought an orb was a... Possibly a spirit. And that is something that's very common in the paranormal field. If you Google orbs, you'll find literally millions of pictures of, of orbs, which people think are lots of different things. Some people think they're, they're spirits of dead people or deceased individuals. Some people think they're fairies. Some people think they're aliens. But and that isn't the case, is it? That is not the case. There are many, many things that create orbs, right? Yes, like dust, dead skin cells. It could be hair fibers, uh, clothing fibers. That's right. Uh, cat dandruff for dead skin cells from cats, animals, pets, all sorts of things. And mold and pollen. And these are all very, very small things that you can't readily see with the naked human eye. But when you combine the effects of something that can float in the air and is literally around us at all times, the only time you wouldn't be around dust if you were in some sort of a clean room in a hospital mm -hmm. where they have negative air pressure and they, they clean the air you know, many, many times uh, per hour to prevent that sort of thing from being in there because it can cause people, those, certain people to be very ill. In this instance, we have a combination of a camera flash, right? Correct. And the camera flash is extraordinarily bright. Yep. And when that happens, it illuminates things very well, namely the people in the picture, like Correct. us. Correct, yep. That, yeah, selfie we took. Uh, but also, it'll illuminate everything that's between us in that camera lens. Correct. And so depending on a number of factors, uh, things such as how far away that camera lens is from the item that you're taking a picture from, the focal length of what that camera is, so that depends, each camera will be a little bit different. And also how close and how bright the flash is to the camera lens can increase or decrease your chances of actually capturing uh, an orb, if you will. But as we know, you know, there's many things that can cause it. We talked about the kind of the, the microscopic uh, items, but there's also things that you can see with the human eye. Things like bugs yep. can show up, and they show up as they, they're, they're they're larger, so they reflect more of the flashback, and so they, they look more solid, if you will. Yep. Whereas things that were dust or mold or, or pollen spores, uh, those are actually look kind of see-through. And they appear almost um, exactly round a lot of times. And that's just because how the light refracts off and reflects back off of that orb. And the reason why it appears as large as it does is, is for two reasons. Uh, number one, the, the piece of dust is actually out of focus. If it was in focus, you wouldn't be able to see it because it's very, very small. But because it's out of focus, it's reflecting that flashback towards the camera lens and it appears much larger than it actually is. The other thing is actual physical distance to the camera. Because again, the focal length of that camera and that camera lens is gonna determine whether or not that um, orb is even gonna show up. Usually it has to be within the first um, few inches of the actual camera lens for it to reflect the light back and be out of focus to be captured by the camera in the first place. Right. So this is something that, again, has been captured literally millions of times. And at the advent of digital cameras, we've seen a, a huge increase in that. And that's because before, when you had like a 35 millimeter camera or even a Polaroid camera, you had to develop every single picture that you took. And so how careful were you when you took those oh, pictures? Oh, those things were expensive. You had to take them and get them developed at your local store. Yeah. And it, it got pricey. And you only had 24 pictures on a roll. Exactly. So it's very important you make sure you take every picture very carefully. And nowadays, you could take thousands of pictures at one on one you know, SD card or internal uh, storage memory for your camera, and then you just kind of go through them later. Yep. And this adds a second level of, of error, right? You know, what right. happens? Well, because you're not remembering what was all going on at the time of the picture. So you take a bunch of pictures and you go back six months later to clean out some of those pictures to make room for the other thousands of pictures you're gonna take, and you start seeing stuff, but you don't remember exactly what happened when you took that picture. Unlike when you had to use film, you, would, you knew exactly what you were taking a picture of. You know, there's a, there's a lot of aspects about uh, orbs that are, are difficult for people to understand. And a lot of it is, is re regarding how cameras work. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily, we were able to uh, communicate with someone who is a, kind of an expert on the subject. Uh, his name is Kenny Biddle. He's an author and a photographer. Actually wrote a book called Orbs or Dust. Uh, it's a great read. Highly recommend it. And he was willing to sit down with us to uh, kind of go over the, the physical aspects of what uh, is happening with cameras and, and pictures and when orbs are actually captured.
the belief is is that orbs represent a ball of energy so it's it's considered a ghost it's a, a, a visual sign of a ghost and some of the explanations that I've heard is that energy is kind of like a bubble the air inside applies equal pressure on all sides so it creates this bubble uh, in essence an orb the spirit energy inside is acting equally on all sides and it gives that shape. I've also heard explanations about different colors of orbs representing the emotions of the spirit. Right. <laughs> Which, I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep a straight face when I say it, but it's funny, the color chart really amuses me. It really comes down to understanding photography, light, and how the, the image sensor or film in the camera works. The most common cause of orbs are dust particles. Problem with dust particles and other things like little insects, bugs, uh, raindrops, this stuff gets right in front of the lens. I mean, we're talking a few inches. And when that flash fires, it bounces off of this little speck of dust or this little insect and it reflects that light back at the camera. The problem comes in when the camera is not focused on that little speck a few inches in front of the lens. It's actually focused on like a subject that's maybe five, 10 feet away or the room. It's, it's maybe set to infinity for the focus. So it's looking at everything else in the background. And it's a real simple thing to demonstrate. I can actually show you something here. I have this clear piece of plastic and just looking at it, you can see that there's markings on it. You can see it pretty easily. But when I come all the way up to the camera, you can see a lot of those markings become transparent because they're out of focus and I can actually go in front of my face and you can still see my face through that little speck. That's pretty much the process that's going on. The speck of dust, the little bug becomes out of focus and you can pretty much see around it and it's almost like it's not there. You see that little smudge. That's the basic idea behind orbs. This is mainly about orbs. We're talking about also, you know, the ectoplasmic mists that also are, are caught on camera sometimes. You have, um, you know, still images will come across sometimes. It's, you know, kind of looks like smoky, billowy sort of stuff. And sometimes it looks like lines that go through, which are like vortexes that I've been told that come across. So do you, uh, can you explain what those are? Wow, there, that actually covers three different things. Um, when you have the lines that are often referred to as vortexes, they're usually the camera strap. We don't see them much anymore. Uh, because most people, they, they have their digital cameras and they usually have a, a neck uh, strap. So you don't really have to deal with the wrist straps that used to come with the cameras. That Another instance, when you look at old photographs that have this vortex, it's usually a double line. It's usually coiled or braided. And if you notice the actual photograph, it's in portrait mode rather than landscape, which means uh, portrait mode, I'm going to use an example. Portrait mode is when the picture looks like this. Landscape is when it's this way. So usually what happens when you had that wrist strap on, you took this camera and you went like this to take a portrait and the wrist strap would fall in front of the lens and the flash would light it up. You'd get that out of focus braided look to it. Um, other things that happen is the, the you mentioned they have a smoky consistency. Basically, sometimes it is smoke. <laughs> it's basically smoke. Uh, people smoke. I've captured smoke from a cigarette, a single cigarette, from up to 35 to 40 feet away. Um, and that was in no wind. That was just dead. It was just drifting. So I was able to pick that up. Uh, also, your your breath. Basically, your breath. When it's cool out. Right. And it doesn't have to be cold. This is something people have to remember. It does not have to be cold. It can be as high as like 60, 65 degrees. If you have a high humidity and the air that's coming out of your lungs, because basically what you what happens is you breathe in, you breathe in air, it gets into your lungs, it picks up moisture, it heats up because of your body temperature, and then you exhale. So when you exhale, the, the air that's coming out is hotter sometimes than the outside temperature. And when that happens, you get ice crystals that form. So if you're holding a camera, but it's right in front of you like this, and you're looking through the LCD screen, and you're breathing right on, underneath the camera, it's more than reasonable to assume that you're going to get that. In colder weather, you're going to get a lot more, and everyone's seen it. You've seen your frosty breath. It's very common, and people use the LCD screen on their cameras to watch what they're doing, and they don't realize that they're breathing in front of it because the flash hasn't gone off yet. Mm -hmm. As soon as the flash does, it lights up that frosty breath, and you get this smoky image. 
that's basically the three big ones. Thanks a lot, Kenny, for that. In general, still pictures for PIM, we don't really use them that much, except when we're doing what we call baseline photos. Uh, but if there's people out there who think, oh man, I really like taking lots of pictures of my investigations, do you have any like tips or things that you could provide to say like, well, if you wanna take still photography on your investigations, these are some things you should make sure you're keeping track of to, to make sure that you're not uh, actually contaminating your own pictures. I would say take a lot of pictures. I mean, I, yeah. I if I go out on, a, on an investigation with somebody, with a, like a group or a team, I would recommend take a lot of pictures. Don't just take one random picture and then walk away because you have nothing to compare it to. I would take five or 10 pictures and that way you can look at them in sequence and say, all right, there's a lot in this picture. What was I doing? Um, pay attention to what you're doing. If you're outside and it's cool out, if you're wearing a hoodie or a jacket, understand that you're gonna get your breath. Keep it away. Put it at arm's length. I mean, it, it's not going to totally eliminate it, but it will cut down on the amount of photos you get that have these these ecto mist kind of things in it. Uh, understand that the flash is going to go off in dark environments because basically everybody loves turning the, the, the lights out. You know, that's the spooky factor. So they love doing that. If you're, you're going to get the flash, you're going to get dust particles. There is no dust free zone. Unless you're in a scientifically controlled lab that's expensive as hell, <laughs> you're not going to have a dust-free environment. So you're going to get this. Uh, if it's hot out, you're going to get insects. You're going to get a lot of this stuff. So be prepared. Don't jump at the conclusion that, you know, little balls of light are ghosts. Keep taking pictures. That's really great advice, actually. Uh, it, it reminded me of something else that uh, is, is not really an or, but it, is, it shows up in still photography a lot, especially on parallel investigations, which are done in low light situations. So can you talk a little about some of the dangers of cameras, especially with they have automatic settings that will automatically sometimes go to this. People don't understand it, and that can result in some very interesting pictures. When you turn the flash off, uh, and, and I've heard people want to do this like they specifically do this they go into a dark environment and they turn a flash off because they want to avoid like orbs or ecto and stuff like that so they yeah. turn a flash off and i think that's a bad idea because that automatically forces your camera to look at the environment and say there's not enough light here and that's exposure time um exposure time will increase from a fraction of a second you can get one two three five seconds depending on how dark it is. And then other factors come into play. Is anybody in the scene moving? Uh, are you holding the camera by hand? Because if you are, you get what's called camera shake because no one can hold a camera still. And if you're holding it for like four seconds, it's gonna shake around. And that means that any point of light in that environment, in that frame that you're taking a picture of, whether it's a light source, like a, a, like a light bulb, or it's a reflected source, like uh, light shining off of brass, all those points of light are gonna start drawing on your image. And it, it's it's basically called light painting. It's a, it's a photography technique, but a lot of people do it by accident when they're taking pictures in the dark. And you're gonna get all these crazy zigzags and a, a good telltale sign that that happened in your photograph is look at all the points of light and see if the patterns match up. Then there's, there's the problem of people moving. You can start to take a picture in a, in a scene, and if someone is moving across the scene, if they pause for a second and then keep going, you're gonna get a very faint image of a person. Yeah, we actually had something like that happen where we had to flash off, we were taking a long exposure picture, and somebody went through the frame and looked at it afterwards, like, well, it looks like there's you know a ghost person here with a big zigzaggy light going through. Well, Kenny, thanks so much. Appreciate you taking the time to lend us some of your expertise. Um, patiently waiting for your version two of the, the Orbs or Dust book, so make sure to let me know when that's out. And uh, we'll definitely check in with you later if we have some more questions on the other uh, videos that we're doing. So thanks so much. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. Well, that's all we have for uh, Photographic Anomalies. As always, thank you so much for watching. If there's any questions or something you'd like to know more about, please leave those in the comments below. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell so you'll be notified next time that we have a new video. I'm Gravy. And I'm Noah with the Paranormal Investigators of Milwaukee. And this has been another Paranormal 101.
And uh, so, uh, dang it. <laughs> I'm gravy. So that's just another common thing we run into with photographic anomalies. anomalies. That's correct, yes.